们三 w 点 gamebonfire 点 com 来加入游戏闯火者的行列。The first trailer for Marvel's Midnight Suns, the new tactical RPG from Firaxis, the studio who brought us XCOM: Enemy Unknown, just dropped. And based off of the game's title and the trailer, Marvel's Midnight Suns is set in the darker side of the Marvel universe, looking to put you face to face against demonic forces of the underworld as you team up and live among the Midnight Suns, Earth's last line of defense. Presented by Marvel's Midnight Suns. Joining me today is creative director at Firaxis, Jake Solomon, who will hopefully get me up to speed on when and where in the vast Marvel universe this takes place. What's at stake, and most importantly, who is involved? Jake, set the stage for us. What is happening in this game?、Uh, does Midnight Suns exist in the same universe as any other part of Marvel? Just give me the give me the whole spiel. What's going on? The Marvel universe is amazing. Obviously,、uh, it's been a dream to work there, but. The challenge is,、uh, as you can imagine, and as you kind of alluded to, finding your own corner of that universe. And so, for us, we drifted to the darker side of Marvel, you know, the supernatural side of Marvel. So, the stakes in this game are all about the supernatural, and this、um, features one of my favorite comic book runs, which comes from the very early '90s, The Rise of the Midnight Suns, which is set in that sort of very dark supernatural、um, part of the Marvel universe. So, that's kind of exciting for us, is that. We're going to be telling a story that people haven't heard for a very long time with characters that are probably new to a lot of players. So you've got the better part of a century worth of Marvel lore to pull from. What titles and runs did you look to most for inspiration? Obviously, we feature both like really, really popular characters that a lot of players are going to know.、Um, so you know, you've got your characters like Iron Man and, and Captain America and Captain Marvel and Wolverine. But we also really wanted to feature characters that, for us, we wanted to introduce players to them. And so, you know, one of the very first comic book events that I ever read was called Inferno. This was the late '80s. Again, another like classic supernatural story in the Marvel universe,、um, and that featured this character named Magic, and she's this awesome, powerful new mutant who grew up in this hell dimension called Limbo, and so that features very heavily. Also, I think that The Runaways is one of the best books in Marvel history. So we have Nico from The Runaways as well, and so that's again another character that some play. Players may not know, and that's what we're excited about. As well as Robbie Ray's Ghost Rider, and I can't believe I'm saying this. Do people not know who Blade is? Is that possible? I mean, am I that old? But I don't know. Is Blade like a deep cut at this point? Everybody knows Blade. He's the you know he's the guy who said the thing about ice skating uphill. It's, that's he's right. A classic. Yes, that's right. Which I won't repeat here. No, this is a family place.、Uh, now, speaking of which, can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like working with Marvel Games and sort of how you know Firaxis and Marvel got together and what that relationship has been like? Working with Marvel is is, is a dream,、um, but it's just not something I'd ever considered.、Um, and what happened was that Marvel actually reached out to us because a number of their their games team were fans of XCOM. The very first call I had with the Marvel Games team. Um, one of their executive vice presidents of Marvel was on the call, and he had very specific feedback for me about the finale of the XCOM mission. And then a bunch of other people chimed in, and they had all this.、Uh, there are different experiences they wanted to share, and so that was really exciting for me because that meant they knew what kind of games that we make. And so we thought if we can combine our gameplay experience with The narrative of all these characters and their stories that millions of people around、uh, the world love, then it's a match made in heaven. Midnight Suns has the first customizable original character in the form of Hunter. Can you tell us a little bit about who we are playing as and how they fit into the Marvel universe? It was key for us to tell a new story. We wanted to go to a place that we think a lot of players haven't seen before in the Marvel universe, and a big part of that for us was not telling a story about any particular character. You're not Iron Man in this game. You're not Blade. You can control those characters, but instead, we wanted you to put yourself into the game, and we did that by creating the Hunter, which is an all-new superhero that we designed with Marvel, which is completely customizable in terms of how they look, in terms of how they play. Which lets the player feel like they're in the story,、um, and lets them feel like they're experiencing this kind of firsthand. And so they are the child of this ultimate evil named Lilith, the mother of demons. They're an old character, but for a lot of players, it's going to be new. And so we have this relationship between this ultimate evil and the Hunter, which is this new hero we've created, which kind of lets the player feel like they're in the story themselves. 
was there a specific character in Midnight Suns who you can talk about right now, aside from Blade, who you're most excited to sort of uh, flesh out in your own in your own space? The, the thing that we're excited about is there's two fantasies, I think, if you're a fan of Marvel. You, you love to fight alongside the heroes, and a lot of games have done that really well. But from the very beginning, we were more excited about this fantasy of, well, what's it like to live alongside the heroes? When you read the comics, when you watch the movies, I think that that's as exciting to see how they interact with each other, how you could interact with them, choosing who you want to build relationships with. We have this really large cast of characters, 12 heroes in addition to the hunter. So the player has to make choices about, okay, which hero do I build a relationship with? And of course you get all kinds of gameplay benefits and cosmetic benefits, but it's really very narrative where you say, okay, I'm going to be best friends with these characters. And so for me, um, I really like magic. Um, I think that the way that we're doing some characters like Dr. Strange is very exciting, you know? And so it'll be up to different players, like what characters you love, that you know, and then you get drawn into these new characters that we're introducing, like Roddy Reyes, the new Ghost Rider, Nico, Magic, that I, I think it's it's just fun. Every time you play, you know, you kind of find yourself drawn to different characters for different reasons. Awesome. So whether you're a fan of the comics or the fan of the movies, this is a, this is a new, you know, un, untested territory entirely, and there's, there's some surprises waiting in store. Now, you mentioned Runaways, you mentioned Inferno. Are there any other Marvel comics that fans should maybe read to get up to speed with uh, Midnight Suns. Well, there is the original run. I don't, I mean, it is, when you get in there, it's it's dark and it is heavy and it is all 90s. Um, the original run, you know, 1991, which Max, you were a child for, I'm not even sure you were born then. There's lots of flowing hair, you know, there are lots of motorcycles. So I would recommend, if you, if you really want to learn about this, then read that original Spirits of Vengeance run in Ghost Rider and The Rise of the Midnight Suns. Um, that we, yeah, I think I've even got it, got it here. Um, I own, I have mine are like boarded and packed, but yes, we have the, uh, the classic Spirits of Vengeance Ghost Rider run from 1991. So if you're, if you're really deep, you can go into that one, but I'm just saying, you know, beware. There's some, there's some dark, weird stuff in there. Awesome. That's music to my ears. Jake, thank you so much for joining me. Marvel's Midnight Suns is scheduled to release in March 2022 across PC, PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. Till then, make mine Marvel, and for all things Marvel, be it games, comics, movies, and so on, you are already in the right place, IGN. Nuff said. For over three years, Fans of zombies, parkour, apocalyptic dystopias, and games where your decisions have real consequences have been, if you'll forgive the pun, dying to get their hands on Dying Light 2. It's finally on track for a holiday release, and to hold you over until then, here is a full breakdown with tons of brand new info. Let's take a look. Hi everyone, my name is Timon Smektawa, and I'm the lead game designer at Techland. Welcome to the Gamescom edition of Dying to Know. You can watch the previous episodes of the show on our YouTube channel. They reveal many details about the game and showcase unique gameplay videos. So if you still haven't seen them, you know what to do. Last time we showed you the monsters, our special infected enemies. So today let's talk about how to fight them. And not only them, but also the other big threats you will encounter in the world of Dying Light 2, which are us, humans. Unfortunately, humans tend to be the most cruel and brutal species out there, especially during an apocalypse. Before we talk about fighting, let's start with the basics. How do you move around the city? If you watched our previous episodes, you know that a large portion of the city's population has changed into monsters roaming the streets. That's why it's extremely difficult to move around. Unless you can run, climb, roll, swing and jump as the best option to explore the world of Dying Light 2 is parkour. Let's talk about it with my first guest, Katper Kovalchuk, senior game programmer. Kacper, you are in a team directly responsible for creating parkour movement in Dying Light 2. So, what can you tell the Gamescom viewers about it? Well, we're really excited for the players to see what we've prepared for them. They will finally feel this amazing freedom of movement in a city built to support parkour from the ground up. Even the highest building is not an obstacle anymore, but a parkour tool to help you get higher. 
Even those familiar with Dying Light 1 will be pleasantly surprised because we took all that we learned from parkour in DL1 and built everything from scratch. It's a more challenging way than to simply upgrade it, but it's more rewarding as well. Okay, but from my perspective, and I think your perspective as well, creating a realistic movement in an FPP game is very, very difficult. And we have spent a lot of time and resources to make it physical and exciting at the same time. So, how do you feel about it, Casper? We really wanted to improve players' perception of their avatar's body and of what happens to it during parkour. The animators had their hands full, but it definitely makes you feel like a real traceur, which is a person who professionally does parkour. It's all thanks to dozens or, or even hundreds of new animations. It's especially visible with ropes, pipelines, monkey bars, etc. With the increased number of animations, players can almost physically feel each movement while climbing the buildings. It gives them a realistic parkour experience and is also surprisingly simple to master, even for beginners. The city allows players to traverse it effectively as soon as they get there, and their mobility increases more as they learn new skills. There comes a time when players start noticing synergies between movements, and that's when the real fun begins. You literally feel like flowing through the environment. They also find out that the city itself helps them with parkouring, and what might have seemed an obstacle at the beginning becomes an asset once they learn how to use it. Okay, but parkour can be more than just a way to traverse the city. In Dying Light 2, it's quite handy in combat too. Yes, for example, I could stun my opponent with a powerful blow, then use elements of parkour to rebound from him and kick another one. He's also stunned now, so I can rebound from him too. By combining parkour and combat, a skillful player can wreak havoc on both humans and the infected, without even touching the ground. Well, that sounds amazing. So, uh, Kasper, thank you for joining us and thank you for explaining us how the game's parkour system works. And I believe you, the same as I, just can't wait for people to see it in action themselves. Definitely. So thank you once again, take care. So let's talk more about how you can use parkour not only for traversal, but also for combat. And speaking of combat, my next guest is Matt Courtois, lead technical gameplay animator. Matt, ça va? Ça va, merci. Thanks for joining us. I would like to start with something that was quite difficult for us, if you remember, at the very beginning of the project. How to present melee combat in first-person perspective. Oh, I remember. You actually just said, Creating satisfying melee combat from a, a first-person perspective, that's a real challenge. That's why we spent many, many weeks iterating it, improving it, until we got the right feeling. We feel we have created something special, and we're very excited to discover how, how players will, will react to it. So what do you think will excite them the most? I guess, you know, we've, we've worked very hard for our combat to be visceral. So we created many exciting and immersive elements, uh, such as what we call progressive hit reactions. So it's basically consecutive hits on enemies will enhance their reactions. They will react differently based on the, the weapon category you're using, based on the body parts you're targeting. So you can stun them, you can trip them over, you can cut off their limbs, which might sound pretty terrible. But it's also cool, right? And it's, and it's also very useful and, 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 and you know, glory. Uh, the, the direction of your swings also matters, and, and so does your position relative to theirs. We, we worked also with the professional stuntmen to record more, more special, more, more spectacular uh, heat reactions. That was mostly for parkour combat, but also, generally speaking, to highlight players' power and, and to convey as much, as much satisfaction as possible. And I think it's safe to say that immersion is very important in the world of Dying Light 2. It's post-apocalypse, so it's very brutal and very demanding. So to survive, you really need to step up your game. So, I don't know, maybe you have some tips for the players. Maybe you think there's something they should focus on. My, my best advice would be to be creative in combat. So like you just uh, mentioned with Casper, in Dying Light 2, Parkour and combat are very connected. They're, they're even intertwined, right? Allowing players to combine one with the other very easily, very smoothly. So technically, 
You can use the environment in combat, of course, as in kicking an enemy right after a war run, or even end, you can use the enemy to get somewhere you like. So you would just vault over them, trigger a double jump to get higher, maybe somewhere you had trouble reaching before, but if you want, you can also just land back down, trigger a very powerful attack. It's completely up to you. Your options are almost endless. That's what we call creative combat. And to me, that would be the best weapon. Okay, so that's an awesome hint. And thank you for that. And thank you for sharing all of the details. And thank you for joining us. We have used over 3,000 animations of jumps, grips, and other parkour moves to create a few dozen skills that can be mixed and combined, so every player can find her or his own way to survive in the city. In a minute, you will see that in our new gameplay trailer. But first... Today, on TechlandGG.com, we have another gift for you. For those who are already exploring the Dying Light universe in the first game, we have a unique item, the Brilliant Hammer, a weapon from Dying Light 2, which you can use in Dying Light 1. Go to Techland GG and grab it. And if you don't feel like fighting right now, you can get some free posters, wallpapers, or even Aiden's special outfit. As you can see, it's worth to visit TechlandGG.com, but not at this very moment, because now it's time to watch our new gameplay trailer. Here it is. There are sometimes I wonder what this city looked like before all this. <laughs> Probably like many others. People had their ambitions, plans, lives. Now it's all gone. The virus started it, but it was the people who made the world the way it is. This city. Villador. They tell me they had a vision. They had hope. But soon, one vision broke into many different ones. Instead of fighting together, people stood against each other. War broke out. Was it a little bird? Met a broken leg. Hope died. Now the city is falling. Each time we strike down an enemy, we absorb their strength. But I can't let that happen. At least, not yet. I need the secrets the city holds. Oh, fuck. Hey! Still some rats here. I have to pick a side. The bazaar needs good people. You're doing great so far. I have to make a difference. <laughs> Let's check and see. They say that great change is a series of small gestures. How about this series? presented quite a few new tools of destruction that you will soon get to use in Dying Light 2. So now, let's talk with the people that are actually making them. Marek Muschau, lead 3D weapon artist. Hi. And Shimon Strauss, the producer of the weapons team. Hello. The first question maybe to Marek is, Marek, can you explain how we as a team have approached the process of creating weapons of Dying Light 2? Yes, we wanted the weapons to be credible. It's been a long time since the apocalypse and everything of value has already been looted. There 
are in the stores to buy a new weapon, so you need to build your uh, equipment from what you find. That's why we had to design dozens of unique weapons practically from scratch. And actually, that was our design pillar, the modern Dark Ages. Absolutely. Modern Dark Ages is this concept of fallen civilization that moved back people nearly to the Middle Ages. So there are no laws, no rules, no technologies. That's why our weapons, we try to create them um, in a most deadly and violent way. Mm -hmm. And working with that concept, where did you get the inspirations from? Well, citizens of Villador, they could only use stuff they found in the world. So we thought we should do exactly the same. We scavenge. So mostly we've been looking for our inspiration in stores selling agricultural, construction, military tools. But also at places like junkyards. Actually, that's true. So right now we've got nearly 200 of them in game. And even though some of them may look very simple, we've got also quite the opposite, like, I don't know, semi-automatic crossbow. I will love this one. And our weapons are very diverse visually. Each one has a unique design and history. Just by looking at the weapon, you can tell where the maker found the parts. At a military base, a museum, a repair garage. Exactly. It's exactly like that in the game. When you pick the weapon, you instantly realize if it was cobbled together in a street or maybe, maybe made by factions where they have access to welding and steel cutting equipment. Yeah, and don't forget about the mods. Because in Dying Light 2 Stay Human World, if you want to beat your opponent with highly effective weapon, first of all, you need to find a basic version of that weapon and then slowly build it up. That's what we call modding. We've got many types of mods, like defensive ones, let's say improving quality of your handle, or offensive ones, like uh, improving the tip or the blade itself. So I don't think that right now we would have time to talk in details about that, but um, in December, you all be able to add an effect to your favorite weapons, such as fire, freeze, electricity. Shimon, Shimon, let's stop here. Let's leave something for the players to discover. So let's end here. And guys, thank you for joining me. Before I talk with my last guests, I would like to invite you to participate in our UGC contest. Especially you, Gamescom viewers, we are waiting for your submissions. And if you are thinking about competing in the cosplay category, you will want to hear this one. Let me present to you the grand jury that will be choosing the best cosplays of the Dying Light 2 characters. Welcome, Irina Meyer, Lightning Cosplay, Narga and Aoki, and Enginite. And of course, fingers crossed for you, our community. Let the best cosplay win. Check our website for more details. My last guests will explain how the city itself affects combat and movement. Michał Dudziak, game designer. Hello. And Adam Michałowski, senior game programmer. Hi, Tevan. Gentlemen, there's this saying that when you really want to achieve something, the whole world aligns to help you. And basically, that's what is happening in Dying Light to Stay Human. Exactly. Based on the player choices, the world is literally changing and helping you to achieve your goals in combat or exploration. For example, the gameplay will be totally different depending on which factions you support, the survivors or the peacekeepers. Okay, but can you give us more detail? The differences between the factions define how each group can help us. For example, the survivors keep to the roofs and trying to avoid the danger on the ground. For building, they use mostly light materials like wood or scraps, and they can provide you a various amount of parkour helpers, such as amortizers, trampoline, or zip lines. This can change the way how we parkour through the city. On the other hand, we have peacekeepers, the post-military guys who literally keep their feet on the ground. And for building, they use totally different materials. Heavy me objects, metal, or even in explosives. And this can give you a new combat opportunities, like car bombs, heavy traps, or even a new type of a ranged weapon. Yeah, and what's important is that we don't need to remain loyal to just one faction. The city is divided into several zones, and it's in each of them, the players can decide with whom they want to side. 
So while progressing through the storyline, you're able to shape the world to fit your vision and needs. Okay, but we know already that humans are active during the day and monsters come out during the night. But let's reveal more. What are the other differences? Well, monsters attack mostly in groups and they instinctively take advantage of the numbers. So to defend yourself, you have to keep your head on a swivel. Monsters don't use special tactics, but it doesn't mean they are easy. They push forward, so you have to be clever to avoid getting cornered. And to win, you have to stay active, move a lot, and learn to abuse their unique weaknesses. And explosive traps might come in handy. Yeah. Okay, and what about humans? They use increasingly more complex behaviors. As the game progresses, defeating human enemies and monsters will become more and more challenging. But unlike monsters, people cooperate. So while fighting them, we need to closely observe not only individuals, but also the whole group. And of course, there are many more unique subtleties to both humans and monsters, but I think we should let the players discover them on their own. Well, okay, that's a good idea. But all of that sounds very juicy. So let's end here. Guys, thank you for joining me. That's almost all for today. You learned a lot about parkour and combat in Dying Light 2. We showed you that parkour is not just a tool for exploration, but also an important element of combat. You discovered some of the weapons that you will soon get to wield, and you saw how choosing a faction may support your parkour and combat skills. Before we end this episode, we have one more special announcement for you. Dying Light 1 is coming to Nintendo Switch. So yes, it's official now. Soon, you will be able to play the ultimate open world zombie game on a new platform. And we know that a lot of you are playing Dying Light. In June alone, the game was played by close to 2 million gamers. Big thanks to our community. You're awesome. Dying Light 1 for Nintendo Switch will be released in Platinum Edition. This is the most content-packed edition we have ever released. On a single playthrough, it contains over 100 hours of gameplay, not mentioning the time you can spend exploring the world with your friends in co-op mode. More details are coming soon. If you are hungry for more and you want to support us, why don't you pre-order the game to explore it on your own in just a few months? That's all for today. Thank you, Gamescom. And see you in the next episodes of Dying to Know. We need to take a super short break, but you definitely don't want to go anywhere because coming up next is Awesome Indies, a celebration of some of the coolest, weirdest, and most ambitious new games from independent developers.